Hello there, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for the first day of winter, December 21st, 2017. I hope your afternoon and your Christmas holiday season, etc., is going well. And uh, it's time to talk about some things that we look at as we look ahead. We don't ever say look forward to. Uh, we look ahead to the 2018 hurricane season, still many months away. But there are some large puzzle pieces that we can keep track of to see how those may fit together, or in some cases, they don't fit together, and you really don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming season. One of those that we keep track of is the Southern Oscillation Index, or the SOI, and typically when it's strongly positive and consistently so, we are in La Nina, and when it is negative and consistently so, we are in an El Nino situation, and sometimes it hovers near zero, and that's when we are in neutral conditions across what we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the Enso region of the tropical Pacific. And with all that being said, here's September, October, November, uh, pretty much positive the whole time. Uh, the daily contributor, the pressure differences between Tahiti and Darwin. Darwin, of course, in Australia. And then you get the negative number today because of the pressure differences. I'm not going to go into the particulars of exactly how this is calculated. I like to just look at the bigger picture. In the last 90 days, we're basically, we can just round that up to positive 8. And for the last 30 days, at around 3.6. So, the SOI has fallen. We've gone from 10.4 in November, and it's come down a little bit to you know 3.6 or so over the last 30 days. So the pressure pattern, not quite as conducive for La Nina, but it is still there. And we'll just check on this from time to time and see what the numbers are doing. And if there's any dramatic changes, we will notice that in the Southern Oscillation Index first. And then you typically see a change in this, what the sea surface temperature anomaly pattern looks like. And typically, when the pressure is very low, over way over here, off the chart even, uh, in the Western Pacific, and you have high pressure in the Eastern Pacific, then that air flows from east to west, the trade winds are stronger, and you get this La Nina pattern. This is an oversimplification of it, but that's generally the pattern that we are in right now with this very strong signature of a La Nina, much colder than normal sea surface temperatures, even in the subsurface, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, meanwhile, in the Atlantic, uh, ocean ter uh, sea surface temperatures are quite a bit above the long-term average. All through the main development region, you don't see any patches of blue. The Atlantic running warmer than normal as we end 2017. And really, the Northwest Atlantic, this sticks out a lot. Uh, very, very warm compared to normal. Several degrees Celsius above the long-term average. So that's really interesting. And you also notice how much of the rest of the Pacific is colder than normal, including up here in the subtropical eastern Pacific. The PDO, or what we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, has been positive for something like 40-something months or something. i got to go and research that. Basically, the Pacific over the last several years has been in a warm state overall, and that looks like that might be changing with a warmer Atlantic than we have seen over the last few years. It's been steadily increasing, and thus we've seen a pretty good increase in hurricane activity. 2016, and then of course 2017, another record setter, a top 10 event in all of recorded history, and I think we can see why. The balance is no longer there. If you're Star Wars fans, well, here you go. You've got a, uh, a disturbance here, uh, to use a cliche, in the force with very cold in the Pacific, very warm in the Atlantic, and that is not in balance. And so with that imbalance comes conflict. And I mean, honestly, it's true. I'm not just clicheing it. Uh, you get these hurricanes because everything is out of balance in one of the basins here, in the Atlantic Basin in particular, being quite a bit warmer than normal. All right, harped on that long enough. Let's just look at the wider perspective. And let's just change this to black. You can really see here how large an area of cold water this is relative to the rest of the globe. And uh, in the Atlantic, this really puts it into perspective. Very large area of warmer than normal water in the uh, North Atlantic. And even in the tropical Atlantic, this warm area 
really things are definitely out of balance globally. And so it really was no surprise when you go back and look. You can say, yep, I would assume that's why we had the hurricane activity that, that we did. And the Atlantic Basin and the Pacific as a whole way, way down. And that has dragged the global activity down. Even as busy as the Atlantic was, global tropical cyclone activity was down in 2017. So that's what I'm saying. It's out of balance. There hasn't been an equal distribution of tropical cyclone activity. It was mostly concentrated in the Atlantic Basin where, I'll say it once again, things were warmer than normal as a whole. So there you go. All right, so this is the subsurface map, and I'm going to refresh this so that we can see it as an animation. I said I was going to do that the next time we looked at it, and here it is. So this is a slice of the tropical Pacific, the surface at the top, 450 meters deep at the bottom, the eastern Pacific over here. Uh, kind of think of this like a CAT scan. It's not, but that's, think of it as one, okay, so that you can see through the water, so to speak. And so you see all these colors here, the deep blues representing the La Nina pattern that's in place and how this has evolved over time. And yeah, over the last couple of months, we have developed this warm pool in the eastern Pacific, but note, I'm sorry, the western Pacific, western Pacific, but you notice it really hasn't made much progress to the east here. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have a mechanism, strong westerly winds, they are not there. The pressures are still lower over on this side of the Pacific. I'm trying to draw an L here for you. Uh, and over on the eastern Pacific, they're higher. So the net flow of air has been this way, keeping this warm pool pushed where it normally resides, in the western Pacific. When the trade winds relax, and we see that with the Southern Oscillation Index, when that starts to go negative and you have higher pressure over here, lower pressure in the eastern Pacific, then you have the mechanisms to start to drive that warmer water to the east and create an El Nino pattern. And that is not happening just yet. And most of the climate models, for what it's worth, don't show that happening over the next several months. But they're not very reliable. So we just, that's why I like to look at this, because this is not a forecast. This is what has happened, and this is what is happening now with the latest snapshot about a week ago. All right, if you have interest in boating or whatever in the Gulf of Mexico, all the shelf water area up here, pretty chilly. Still, though, the 26 degrees Celsius isotherm, and then even here, 27 Celsius, 81 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a few areas of 26 C down there in the Bay of Campeche. Yeah, the Gulf is war war running warmer than normal as well, not significantly above normal, and it really doesn't matter too much what the Gulf does or doesn't do in the off season. It's always going to be warm enough for hurricane activity by August, September, October, the peak months. Uh, but for now, it's interesting to see that there is still this very large area of uh, 26 degrees Celsius right here in the loop current, the central southeast Gulf of Mexico region. And we'll be able to keep an eye on that. So spring break several months away. Maybe the water temperatures will get warmer. You know, this is driven a lot by these fronts that do or don't push through. When you get a strong cold front that comes down, and then the northerly winds and the northwest flow, what we call cold air advection, blowing over the top of this like blowing across the top of your coffee to cool it off. We really haven't had much of that. It's not been a brutal November and December as of yet, and I don't see that coming anytime soon. Nothing severe in terms of cold outbreaks over the northern Gulf Coast and even farther south from there. So, and yeah, even despite the snow that we saw, really no brutal cold, so the Gulf has stayed a little bit warmer than normal. Uh, looking at the East Coast and the Western Atlantic as a whole, here too, 26 degrees Celsius right here in the Gulf Stream off of South Carolina and Georgia. You get in the boat, you go out about 100 miles or so, and the water temperatures are 80 degrees at the surface. That's amazing. It really is the power of the Gulf Stream. Uh, no major winter storms to tap into this just yet. I would suspect that we will see something in January and February. We usually do. All right, so that's it for the... Um, no, actually, I actually have a few more things in the tropics. I was getting ready to move to lower 48 weather. Um, so Phil Klotzbach and Colorado State University's team that does the forecasting of the hurricane seasonal outlooks 
uh, issued a December sort of um, a look ahead, sort of keys to the game as I call it, and I just did a little screenshot to just highlight the five possibilities that Dr. Klotzbach and his crew are looking at, and uh, the number one, and these are just not in order of like, you know, we think the first one's the more likely. I mean, you can see it says 35% chance, and that's the most likely right now, and that would be a warmer than normal Atlantic. That's basically what that means. And no El Nino in the Pacific with a, about a 30% higher than normal hurricane season. Uh, that has the highest chance of happening according to his research right now. Uh, but if the AMO, the warmer Atlantic, becomes even warmer and um, no El Nino happens, then you know there's a one in four chance that we could have a very busy season next year, and then a pretty slim chance here that we have a cold Atlantic, a, a below average AMO, that stands for Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, just a fancy way of saying the Atlantic is warmer or colder than normal. A positive AMO is where we are right now, just barely, and you have an El Nino developing too, then we'd have like no hurricane season to speak of in terms of overall numbers. So this is something we can keep a track, keep a track of, Keep track of over the next several months, there will be a quantitative forecast in April where Dr. Klotzbach and his team actually issue numbers for what it's worth. Again, you know, some people hate this, and that's okay. That's fine. The science is still young. They've done this for about 30 years. That's nothing in geologic time, okay? And in climatological scheme, 30 years is nothing. It's going to take another 30 years probably to really refine this where we can say, hey, in August, we think Texas is really going to get a hurricane. That's an example. Maybe in the future that'll come. you got to start somewhere. So I applaud the effort. I really do. Uh, and it's come a long way, you got to admit. A yeah, story for another day. Let's keep moving. So the CFAN folks, uh, I forgot what that stands for. Let's see. Up here, Climate Forecast Applications Network. They are predicting, this is just from their Twitter page, 80% uh, chance of above average. Oh, look, I, I, I redacted it. I didn't mean to. That's what I wanted. I wanted to highlight it, not cross it out. 80% chance of an above average 2018 hurricane season. So you know, basically what I'm showing you here is uh, Colorado State, CFAN, and then Tropical Storm Risk out of London, uh, indicating that they think that there will be a slightly above average season for next year. So basically three groups so far in terms of what we see right now, which is, this one more time, move this out of the way, go over it, warmer than normal Atlantic, cold Pacific, if this stays, probably going to have a busy season next year. It's not rocket science. Typically that's usually what happens when that pattern is in place. Now, moving on to lower 48 weather. Uh, a lot of travel coming up for Christmas. What's it going to be like? This is the 5,000 foot temperatures, sea level pressure, and precipitation animation from the GFS from this morning over the next several days. So this little blue line right through here is where your uh, freezing line is at 5,000 feet in the atmosphere. And you can see, I think you know by now what a storm would look like. There's one right there. It'll loop again in a minute. You don't see any major storm systems. You don't see any giant chunks of air coming out of Canada. There's some there. You see how it spills and spreads out a little bit. The air, like molasses, spreads out, that high pressure. There's a little storm system here for Christmas. Probably going to see a white Christmas for portions of New England. We can freeze that when it gets to it. Freeze the frame, that is. There's the 23rd. Here's Christmas Eve. One storm goes past. And then we have another one that tries to develop as we get into Christmas uh, Eve night and into Christmas morning right there. Just a, you know, interior snowstorm for New England, but no massive winter storms as of yet. And uh, if we go to the end of this uh, loop, which is seven days, you know, even out to the 28th of December, no giant areas. I mean, that's pretty cold, 1054 millibar high into Montana and the Dakotas. Um, but nothing record-breaking, and that's good, I guess. I mean, if you like winter, then you're left behind right now for the most part, especially in the east and the deep south. 
But, you know, in the northern tier states, southern Canada, etc., um, it's wintertime. You're probably not going to escape that, even as the climate seems to be warming. Uh, it's still going to have winter, but it's just a matter of the, to the extent that we have that winter. But the bottom line, no major storms on a large scale. Maybe some snow for New England for Christmas. Why not, right? Uh, elsewhere, probably not much of a white Christmas unless it's already on the ground. The Rockies, the Intermountain West, places like that. All right, well, that's it for me for now. Did a little bit later in the week. I wanted to do the update here on the solstice just for fun sake, right? The winter solstice. Hey, I did an update on the first day of winter, kind of thumbing my nose at winter because I'm a summer guy. I like it when it's warm and humid and convective outside. If it's going to be cold and dry, it should snow. And as I just showed you, not much chance of that except for New England, maybe around Christmas and in the northern tier states. Have a great Christmas, speaking of that. Safe travels if you're heading out to visit friends, family, co-workers, partying, you name it. Uh, be safe out there. I want you back to be able to catch future updates, all right? I'll be back next week, probably Monday or Tuesday, with another look at the off-season conditions in the tropics and elsewhere. Again, I'm Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thank you for tuning in. I much appreciate it, and I'll talk to you again next week.